good evening, everyone. Um, it, it's really a great uh, honor and a, a pleasure uh, to be here to deliver the keynote address for this uh, uh, FMS forum. Um, you know, I used to study uh, in Delhi and uh, have always heard such wonderful things about FMS, uh, a, a great academic institution, uh, produced uh, a lot of great students, a lot of great alumni who've kind of conquered the world uh, in the business sphere and elsewhere. So, so it's really a great uh, uh, honor to be here with you. Um, so, so the topic of today's uh, uh, lecture, which I was given, is the world is reset, or what lies ahead? So in a sense, uh, one needs to look back a little bit uh, in order to be able to look forward and see uh, what's going to happen. Um, of course, you know, there is a kind of uh, cardinal, you know, sin of forecasting, uh, which is that we tend to always extrapolate uh, the recent past. Uh, you know, there's a kind of recency bias to our thinking, which we need to kind of somehow get out of. And in fact, even as, you know, we look ahead and peer into the future, you know, the words of probably the greatest economist, uh, John Maynard Keynes comes to mind. He said, uh, the inevitable never happens. It's the unexpected always. So, so kind of with that, uh, uh, you know, humility, uh, let's turn and, and see uh, what has happened and what lies ahead. Um, of course, this is the, this, the strangest of years. I mean, there is no doubt about it. And on this, uh, you know, evening, uh, you know, the strangest of years is not just because uh, you know, I India, uh, uh, you know, scored one of the lowest uh, 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 runs in test cricket in an inning ever and, and the kind of pretty devastating loss to Australia. That's not uh, what makes it strange. Uh, it is the strangest of years because of, you know, the COVID pandemic. Um, just to give you a sense today, if you go to the Johns Hopkins website, it will tell you that uh, the reported cases are 76 million, uh, about 1.75 million deaths. Um, and we know that uh, so the cases, for example, is almost certainly five to 10 times more uh, than what's being reported. That's true um, of India as well. Deaths are probably also much greater than reported. And of course, the IMF has forecast that this is going to be one of the most devastating years for the world economy. Um, also, we know that this, you know, all the experience of the COVID crisis around the world uh, tells us that uh, the impact is going to be very unequal, you know, between men and women, between those who have and those who don't, uh, between those who are educated and those who are uneducated, between those who can move and those who cannot move. So, so it's going to be really a, a very unequalizing kind of shock uh, in the world. And, and if you think about it, it's probably going to be the, uh, 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 the event that has most disrupted normalcy uh, in the world and, and kind of all over the world, not just uh, outside of wartime. One cannot think of anything that's affected uh, the world uh, so much. Um, you know, uh, there's an there's a, there's a old saying which is more like a Chinese curse, which says, you know, may you live in interesting times. Uh, and, you know, the Chinese curse part of it seems uh, so kind of resonant because uh, in some ways, you know, this pandemic originated in, um, in China. So, so against that backdrop, um, when you say, you know, how is this pandemic going to change the world? I, I think it is, you know, the pandemic itself is probably going to change the world uh, in in ways and, and maybe not in other ways, which, you know, we can talk about in a little while. But I think the, the way in which the pandemic will change the future is by already, you know, acting upon uh, some very clear pre-existing trends, trends that were happening in the world economy even before the COVID crisis hit. Now, there's a lot to discuss. We have only a very short time. And let me highlight, you know, three or four big trends of the past, which I think looking forward, we have to see um, whether they will persist or not. And I'll give some tentative, uh, you know, 
uh, answers to some of these questions. For me, the biggest, as an economist who studies uh, India and the developing world, for me, the most positive trend uh, you know, of the last 25, 30 years is in some ways the fact that this was the golden age for developing countries, you know, especially China, especially India. But it was a golden age because, you know, for the last 25, 30 years, um, uh, you know, it's the economic prosperity that these countries have enjoyed, the number of people who've been pulled out of poverty, the access to goods and services, you know, the range of uh, things that, you know, the, the young can do. Uh, it's been extraordinary. You know, if someone had said, uh, you know, uh, to me when I graduated from, you know, I, I also did a, a business degree. When I graduated from my MBA in 1981, uh, this was kind of in, in the dark socialist era of India. If someone had sen, said that 40 years later, you know, India would be what it is today, uh, I, I think we'd have just uh, uh, laughed it off. Uh, but it has been extraordinary, the journey. So, so I think, uh, but this has been more broadly true, not just of India, but China, a host of other developing countries. Finally, they have started catching up with standards of living in advanced countries. Uh, and of course, you know, advanced countries pulled away from the world after the Industrial Revolution. Uh, India and China got left behind, but finally they've started catching up. So that was one of the most heartening, encouraging, positive, uplifting developments of the last 25, 30 years. And of course, the question is what's COVID, the pandemic, going to do to that trend? I think um, a, a related, of course, uh, when you look at the world, uh, a, a trend that was visible, uh, this was something that I wrote about uh, in my book called Eclipse, which is essentially the rise of uh, uh, China and the decline of the West more broadly, uh, especially that of the United States. Um, uh, I wrote a book 10 years ago kind of predicting this development. Uh, it's turning out to be true, uh, you know, is some in expected ways, some in uh, unanticipated ways. And, uh, you know, it, the COVID pandemic is, is going to have uh, an impact on that, uh, uh, you know, the rise of China and the supremacy and the dominance of China uh, in the world economy. Um, some slightly, of course, darker developments around the world has been, you know, the rise of inequality and the rise especially of a certain kind of inequality where a few people uh, get uh, most of uh, you know, the, uh, the gains from economic activity. People at the very, very top appropriate most of the gains. And you know, uh, this was happening for about uh, 25, 30 years, essentially uh, after World War II, uh, for about 25, 30 years, things were becoming more equal. But since about 1980, uh, the French economist Thomas Piketty has documented this fact that inequality has started rising all over the world, especially in the Anglo-Saxon world. And of course, this gives rise to questions of whether, you know, kind of capitalism as we know it is going to survive uh, the pandemic or not. So that's kind of the third major development. And uh, on the, the the political counterpart of this development, of course, has been you know what we call you know the rise of uh, uh, you know a, a certain kind of either you can call it democratic authoritarianism, you know illiberal populism, where uh, you know we see regimes around the world uh, which are practicing a particular brand of politics and becoming very successful uh, doing so. So. so uh, you know, what will the pandemic do to capitalism more broadly, to uh, democracy more broadly, uh, is going to be uh, uh, another question, because these were trends that were happening uh, even before. Um, a couple of other things, of course, is that, you know, which we can talk about, the rise of artificial intelligence and technology, and of course, you know, or ongoing uh, climate change, which is going to affect, uh, you know, countries around the world, uh, especially uh, poor countries. Now, uh, you know, there are many, many other pre-existing trends we can talk about, but these are some of the main ones. And I want to now look ahead and say, you know, how is the pandemic uh, going to uh, affect some of these trends? First, will the prosperity uh, that countries like India and China enjoyed 
over the last 30, 40 years? Will it continue after the pandemic? I think that um, there are two or three key things that are going to shape that. One is the world going to you know, continue with globalization or is the world going to pull back? Uh, are all countries going to retreat behind their borders, you know, putting restrictions on immigration, putting restrictions on I flow of ideas, putting restrictions on the flow of capital, you know, uh, or, and, and on goods and services? Um, uh, my own sense is that that there is uh, uh, one shouldn't be too pessimistic, especially for a country like India. Um, some of the impact of this pandemic could actually play to India's strengths, because even if we see deglobalization, I, I think we will continue to see a certain kind of globalization, uh, which will lead to greater flow of kind of services, especially across the border. You know, uh, even what we are doing now, this uh, would have been unimaginable, uh, in, you know, 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. But these are the kinds of opportunities that I think we will see. And, and while there will be pressures uh, for countries to retreat behind uh, their borders, their economic borders, I think there will be opportunities there uh, for countries like India. Uh, the other big uncertainty, of course, is, uh, is technology, the rise of artificial intelligence. Um, is it going to displace jobs? You know, there's a, there was a very famous study which showed that um, even in clothing and textiles, uh, a, a sector that India should be more uh, active in, we found that, you know, uh, these technologies, uh, if they start kind of, if robots can start cutting soft cloth, uh, it's going to jeopardize employment pro uh, opportunities in a number of developing countries uh, such as India. Uh, and so this is something uh, that we need to watch out for, uh, which could be potentially a, 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 a big risk and a challenge for a country like India especially because we know that these technologies are going to favor um, you know, more skilled at the expense of the less skilled and the Indian education system, which has uh, needs a lot of improvement. You know, uh, we have outstanding institutions like FMS, uh, but you know, primary education uh, and schooling in general, we know that learning outcomes are you know, less good than they should be. And I think that's something that the interaction between technology and levels of education are going to uh, pose a big, big challenge uh, to how prosperous countries like India can be uh, going forward. The next question, what is the pandemic going to do to China's rise? Um, Sure, I think one. Ha I know there are other panelists who, who will speak to this question uh, of China's rise. I think um, uh, my own view is that uh, we are in a, in a very uh, kind of a delicate situation. You know, we used to think that China's rise could be managed without serious conflict uh, in the world. Uh, I don't think people are any longer sure of that uh, anymore. Uh, I think that, uh, uh, especially under the Xi Jinping regime over the last five, six years, uh, it's turned much more repressive domestically, much more aggressive internationally, uh, and, and therefore the world will have to find ways of cooperating with China, because China is still very big, uh, of competing with China, a country like India especially, and uh, confronting China. So. Uh, this is going to be the big challenge going forward because China's rise is no longer uh, uh, no longer can we take for granted that China's rise will be peaceful, uh, and that's going to be a a, a big big challenge. Uh, the the a few others, you know, uh, the future of democratic politics, I think, is going to be um, um, uh, very tricky as well, uh, and I want to come back to that at the end with some maybe positive news. Uh, I think it's going to be a battle between, you know, examples where democratic politics does well uh, and another brand of democratic politics uh, where there's more illiberalism, uh, less checks and balances, um, less protection for minorities. And we're going to see a tussle between these two kinds of uh, uh, democratic politics around the world. Capitalism, I think, um, 
there's going to be a, a lot of adaptation of capitalism around the world. And definitely we're going to see uh, uh, the comeback of the state um, in various dimensions. You know, uh, the state will have to now, you know, monitor pandemics, uh, monitor how people behave in pandemics. Uh, the state will have to now check monopolies. The, the state will now have to check, uh, you know, these kind of uh, practices of you know some of these big technology companies that has led to uh, a, a lot of uh, you know conflict, uh, genocide, and many kinds of uh, adverse outcomes around the world. So I think um, the role of the state is going to expand quite a bit, uh, and that will check, uh, uh, put a check on the private sector and markets more broadly. But I want to end, I think, you know, it is a very uh, kind of, has been a very gloomy year, <clears throat> I think. Uh, but I think on the bright side, uh, I think as we end the year, and this is what I want to tell the students uh, <clears throat> and youngsters who are kind of going to go out into this, you know, fairly uh, uh, challenging world out there. I mean, I think there is a lot of uh, good news that we could build upon. First and foremost, who would have thought that in record time, you know, we could have, uh, the world and science could have delivered a vaccine uh, so effectively and so quickly. I, I think it's, a, uh, it's an enormous tribute to science and the possibilities of science. And it's something this, uh, I think the world will continue to uh, benefit from. Uh, <clears throat> the second, I think, um, uh, uh, hopeful note around the world uh, in, in the wake of the pandemic is that, you know, one of the things that the pandemic has done has uh, shown that, uh, you know, even within the frame of democratic politics, you know, competence matters. And not just matters, competence can be, will be rewarded and will be politically successful. So if you take the example of New Zealand or of Germany uh, or of Taiwan uh, or, or of uh, some uh, Scandinavian countries, you know, there are a lot of good examples of, you know, democracies who are able to uh, uh, deliver, uh, you know, in times of crisis. So the premium on good governance and competence, I think, will <clears throat> increase uh, going forward. And that is, I think, broadly good news for democratic politics uh, and, and governance. Um, the other good news, I mean, I, I, let's be honest, I mean, had the world had four more years of Donald Trump, it would have been a very, very difficult world. And, you know, we're going to at least get some reprieve uh, from that uh, 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 with the United States playing, uh, hopefully, a more constructive role in the world economy. But of course, on the other side, we have a, a regime in China, which is, you know, much more repressive and authoritarian, and authoritarian which is going to be tricky. Um, you know, one thought experiment I want to, you know, kind of leave you with, uh, you know, a kind of something that we should be grateful for, a kind of what if uh, thought, um, you know, the COVID vaccine has, of course, uh, created so much tragedy around the world, and every case and every death is one case and one death too many. But think about uh, what if the COVID had been completely the opposite in its impact? What if a pandemic had, you know, been especially severe on the young and less severe on the old, just the opposite of the COVID pandemic? I think, you know, uh, the world would, would have really have been, I mean, this is, of course, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, it's not that uh, the elderly are not important, they're as uh, productive and, and uh, you know, useful and valuable to the world and their lives are as important. But had, uh, you know, we had to, be uh, anxious about uh, the safety of our children, uh, you know, it would have been a, a much darker world, I suspect, and we've been spared that, and for that we should be grateful. Finally, I think all of us, the, the question on our minds, India, how is India going to do uh, going forward? Is it going to bounce back after what's been uh, quite a, a difficult year for India as well? Uh, I, think, I think there is a, a uh, some good news. I think the economy seems to be bouncing back. But of course, uh, the, the challenges for India, uh, like for the world, were there even before the COVID crisis hit. Um, and so in a sense, India will have a kind of double uh, challenge, whatever was happening before on the economy, plus 
uh, the impact of the COVID. So we should all keep our fingers crossed and hope that uh, not only do we win more test matches in Australia uh, next year, but that our economy uh, uh, and democracy will come bouncing back once again. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Um, you know, <clears throat> uh, I think <clears throat> happy to take questions if there are any. Well, I have to say this, uh, Dr. Arvind Subramanian, that's really a masterclass there. Uh, that keynote, the world is reset, what lies ahead. Uh, uh, Dr. Subramanian, you'd be very thrilled to know, I know our boys were nowhere close uh, to hitting a century, even a half century, that uh, poor display at the Adelaide Oval. But as far as questions are concerned, uh, we've had multiple centuries scored here. You know, hundreds and hundreds of questions coming in, but, uh, uh, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, we can only take three. These are the three Mirchi hot questions, and uh, they're the prize winners. Uh, 30,000 rupees up for grabs in this round, and they get 10,000 rupees each. So let's go to question number one. This is from Anurag. Dr. Subramanian, after the 1920s, when the world had seen the pandemic, a great economic upheaval was on the cards. It was assumed that the economy would go for a toss. However, the world saw the roaring 20s. In your opinion, could we predict the same now? Is his question. Um, yes, uh, it's a very good question. Um, you know, the obvious comparison is with the uh, Spanish flu uh, uh, pandemic of 1918-19, which, of course, which was far more devastating in terms of the deaths. You know, there's something between 6 and 10% of the then global population died. Uh, and it's true that, you know, the economy came back. But, you know, the economy came back in part because of the end of World War I. So there was a natural bounce back uh, of, of from from the uh, war, and of course we saw this. Uh, you know the whole uh, uh, technology side uh, came back once again, but even here there's a cautionary tale because essentially what happened in the twenties, roaring twenties, uh, and a combination of World War One was exactly what led to the rise of fascism and Hitler uh, in, you know, the inequalities. Some of the very trends that we're seeing today were the same trends we saw then, uh, which led to, you know, rise of Hitler and fascism, which led to World War II as well. Uh, so so uh, 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 a lot of, uh, you know, chaos, disruption, conflict happened there. But it's true that it was a period of economic prosperity. But of course, we know that even that economic prosperity went bust. You know, we had the great, you know, we had the stock market crash and the Great Depression, uh, and that led to the rise of the welfare state. Uh, in so, so, so both kind of the ups and downs, uh, uh, the very highs and the very lows of both capitalism and democracy, exactly played out uh, in that 15, 20 year period, uh, as you know, kind of we're witnessing to some extent today, uh, albeit in, in milder form. Next question now. Uh, this is a question that came in from Rahul Samantara. Dr. Subramanian, with the vaccine coming in and things getting better after a global pandemic, slowly but steadily, what things must a country focus on from an economical point of view? Um, also, can the corporate sector and the unorganized or the disorganized sector recover from COVID effects? How can they do that? Yeah, I think that, you know, the vaccine is, of course, unambiguously good news because, you know, once you have the vaccine, uh, you know, you can go back to normalcy in economic life. You know, all the lockdowns, you know, the, uh, the shutting and the closing, the uncertainty that exists, uh, I think, uh, is going to be unambiguously positive. And so that will be a boost. But that's only going to be a short run boost. You know, for a country like India, uh, I would hope that, you know, there are two major things that we should uh, take away from this. One is in the long run, uh, you know, we need to have public health systems which are much more robust uh, than we've had. I mean, we saw, you know, uh, uh, Kerala, for example, you know, at least in the early stages, handled the pandemic very well. And we know the Kerala public health system is much uh, better, but uh, many parts of the country don't have such good health systems. You know, in some ways, 
you know, pandemic, though bad as it was, because of India's younger population, you know, the fatality was lower than what we expected. So in some sense, we kind of escaped, uh, you know, the worst of the pandemic in some ways. I mean, there were other things as well. So I think the public health system is a lesson that we should take away so that we are more resilient and robust, you know, in the future. The other thing for the economy, I would say, is that our, you know, our financial system has been uh, very badly affected even before the financial crisis. Uh, and I think that uh, for the, uh, you know, small scale sector to come back, the SMEs to come back again, they have to get more credit. You know, if there's one number I look at very closely to see if the economy is coming back, is how much credit is flowing uh, to companies, you know, especially not just the big companies, but to the small and medium enterprises. And that needs to come back again if we're going to have a, a you know, robust bounce back in the economy. Okay, we've got one last one, which we're going to squeeze through. Thank you for all your your questions. Thank you for your patience. And uh, keep them coming on the Q&A box because, you know, we're going to take it uh, after the Founders Day uh, uh, Memorial Lecture and also during our panel discussion. Kajal Sharma. Uh, Dr. Subramanian, this is a very a generic management question, more than a micro question or, you know, a question about mm -hmm. uh, India's financial uh, state of affairs. Kajal asks, Dr. Subramanian, I have a question that has been in the back of my mind always. What is most important? Your passion, your interest, your cause or purpose? Passion, interest, cause or purpose? So how have you played that uh, in your diverse career? Yeah, I, I, I think that um, lucky are those whose kind of profession is also their passion and their interest. Uh, I, I think it's that, com I mean, you know, um, more and more, I think, you know, uh, someone said that, you know, the world's labor force is going to consist of two kinds of people, you know, those who think of work as a chore and, you know, kind of reluctantly do it, you know, seven days, uh, five days a week or four days a week. And there are others, you know, and I put myself amongst them who kind of enjoy working seven days a week uh, and, and 24 seven, because, you know, what we do is also the passion uh, and the interest. So uh, I, I think very much, uh, you know, having these passions and interests are kind of, if you have them, uh, I think the rest all falls into place. So, 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 so lucky is the person, uh, you know, my father uh, used to say that uh, life is paradise for those who love many things with a passion. So I think that, uh, uh, that I think is, is probably true. So, uh, you know, find your passions and, you know, pursue them uh, uh, unrelentingly.